There must be a beginning of any great matter, but continuing on to the end until it be thoroughly finished yields the true glory. This quote resonates profoundly with the Uncharted franchise. One might think it was added after Uncharted 4, but Naughty Dog included it as if they knew they were crafting one of the best and most recognizable video game series ever. In the opening scene we are introduced to Nate and Elena. Nate provides coordinates and Elena's show funds an expedition to find Sir Francis Drake's coffin. However, upon opening it, they find it empty. Nate, unfazed, grabs the diary inside and as they argue, they are attacked by pirates. Here is where we are introduced to Uncharted 1's combat system. Rescued by Victor Sullivan after their boat catches on fire, they examine the diary and discover a map of El Dorado. Sullivan suggests cutting Elena loose to pursue the treasure. Upon reaching this verdant island, our heroes are confronted with the game's first puzzle. Given that Uncharted 1 serves as an inaugural entry in this franchise, these puzzles fail to establish a satisfactory level of challenge and innovation. They are undeniably simplistic, requiring little more than perfunctory interactions with Drake's diary or rudimentary manipulation of statues and switches. This lack of depth undermines the sense of challenge and discovery that one would expect from such a renowned franchise. Instead of engaging players with thought-provoking conundrums, these puzzles feel more like obstacles to progress, devoid of the ingenuity and complexity that would elevate them to the level of true brain teasers. After further exploration of the caves, they encounter a level reminiscent of something out of Crash Bandicoot, where they must navigate crumbling platforms while fleeing from imminent collapse. And surprisingly, this is not the only level like this. Later in the game, we get whole sections where you're basically playing Crash. Anyway, as they emerge from the caves, they stumble upon a relic straight out of the 1940s, a German submarine. Here's the twist. As Nate ventures inside, we quickly realize that Uncharted 1 has morphed into a horror game. That's right, brace yourself for a spite-chilling experience filled with skeletons lurking in the shadows, claustrophobic environments that send shivers down your spine, and oh, did I mention the jump scares? Because there are plenty of those. Trust me, you'll see exactly what I mean as we delve deeper into the game. Upon discovering coordinates on a map inside the submarine, Nate emerges from the vessel and onto the shore, only to be greeted by an unexpected visit. Gabriel Roman, the quintessential cartoonish villain of the game. It's at this moment that we uncover the unsettling truth. Sully is deeply in debt to Roman, having mentioned the treasure in a moment of desperation and now Roman seeks to claim it for himself. And in a chilling turn of events, Roman makes the fateful decision to end Sully's life prompting Nate to make a narrow escape. While fleeing, Nate collides with Elena, who has followed them, and after Nate breaks the tragic news of Sully's demise to Elena, they retreat back into the caves with a singular goal, reaching a car parked on the other side, and thus begins the first true shooting section of the game. The shooting system in Uncharted 1 is primarily cover-based, requiring players to strategically take cover and pick out when opportunities arise. However, adversaries are equally adept at utilizing cover, throwing grenades and flanking, forcing players to constantly reassess their positioning. While this combat system functions adequately, it's worth noting that significant improvements are made in subsequent entries of the series. As they locate the car, they hastily make their way to their awaiting airplane, bound for El Dorado Island. However, their journey takes a harrowing turn when the plane comes under fire and crashes, leaving them barely clinging to life. Nate spots the wreckage of their aircraft in the distance, and after dispatching a few more adversaries, he reaches the crash site. Amidst the chaos, he secures a map, but his attention is drawn to something unexpected, Elena's parachute fluttering on top of the castle. Here I want to take a moment to highlight Naughty Dog's ingenious method of guiding players without the need of minimaps and compasses. The developers skillfully ensure that the main objective remains visible in the background, subtly nudging players in the right direction. This design philosophy persists even in their newest game, The Last of Us 2, where landmarks like the ferris wheel serve as visual cues, guiding players towards their next destination. Once Nate finally reaches the castle, we navigate through a series of shooting galleries before encountering a platforming level. Unfortunately, platforming proves to be the game's Achilles heel. Because Naughty Dog's signature yellow cues, commonly used in later titles to denote climbable ledges, are sparingly used here, 
Judging where to leap next remains a Herculean task. Nate's inconsistent jumping abilities add to the frustration. One moment he's soaring like an eagle, and the next he can barely hop a few feet. The controls feel clunky and unreliable, often sending Nate veering in the wrong direction or plunging to his demise when you least expect it. And to add insult to the injury, the absence of checkpoints means that even a single mishap forces you to endure the entire 3 minute section all over again. Once you've completed this platforming section, endured another shooting segment and conquered yet another round of platforming, you find yourself confined within a prison cell, engaged in a conversation with none other than Eddie Raja, aka the funniest character in the Uncharted series. They can't even go outside to take a piss without an armed guard, and I have nothing to show for it! After Elena orchestrates Nate's rescue, we're thrust into the game's first vehicle section, an experience that stands out as the most memorable, perhaps because it spares players from actually driving the pickup truck and instead focuses on shooting from it. You will see what I mean later on. Amidst the chaos, you can't help but appreciate the breathtaking scenery that surrounds you, a testament to why this game was hurled for its graphics upon its release. The lush greenery depicted in this section is simply awe-inspiring, especially considering that this is a 17-year-old game. To put into perspective, in 2007, a 17-year-old game was Final Fantasy III. After navigating through more driving and shooting sequences, Nate and Elena find themselves cornered, setting the stage for what is, in my opinion, the lowest point of this game. In this particular scene, Eddie's character is portrayed in such a cartoonish manner that it shatters any semblance of immersion. Now, you told me not to move! Looks like you're gonna have to come get it! After their escape, Nate and Elena review footage captured on Elena's camera, where Nate spots a boat. The discovery sparks an intriguing conversation between them, revealing a stark contrast in their desires. Surprisingly, it's Nate who advocates for taking the boat and leaving the island, while Elena is determined to pursue the treasure. Let's go! Oh, please! You quit if you want to, but don't use me as an excuse. <laughs> Fine! It's me, okay? I am quitting. Anyway, at this point we encounter the game's second vehicle section, and it's nothing short of dreadful. Controlling the boat feels incredibly clunky, as it constantly changes directions seemingly on its own accord. To make matters worse, aiming is a cumbersome task requiring you to come to a complete stop each time you want to line up a shot. And believe me, you'll want to aim, as you'll find yourself under fire from a barrage of enemies casually lunging on the balconies, armed and ready to take you down. And what's even more astonishing is that this is isn't even the worst boat section of the game. The next one will be much more painful. After enduring the agony of the boat section, we're thrust into a series of shooting levels. It's at this juncture that I'd like to take a moment to kindly ask you to leave a like, subscribe to the channel and share your thoughts in the comments below. I'm genuinely curious to hear what you find to be the most frustrating mechanic in this game. Personally, I'm inclined to say it's the boat levels, but I've heard conflicting opinions. Some argue that it's actually the platforming. What's your take on it? Let me know. After navigating through a few more platforming and shooting sections, we finally arrive at the Harbor Building, an archive of records detailing everything entering the city. As we flip through the pages, we come across the final entry, a depiction of the statue of El Dorado. What events transpired for this to be the concluding entry in this book? It's the question that lingers in our minds. In this pivotal cutscene, we're treated to a beautiful moment between Nate and Elena. Nate opens up, revealing the significance of the ring he carries around his neck and recounting how he managed to locate the coffin at the beginning of our journey. It's a touching exchange that adds depth to their relationship and sheds light on Nate's personal history. This was Francis Drake's ring. I, you know, kind of inherited it. Sick Parvis Magna? Greatness from small beginnings. It was his motto. Following this revelation, their plan to escape the island by boat takes an unexpected turn when they spot Sully on Elena's camera, miraculously alive. In a sudden change of heart, Nate and Elena pivot their objectives, shifting their focus to rescuing Sully from imminent danger. After dispatching a few more goons and enduring the unfortunate loss of our trusty camera, we find ourselves in the dreaded second boat section, also known as the absolute worst, most obnoxious and most frustrating level in the entire game. This segment forces you to navigate the most unpolished boat in gaming history up a winding, treacherous river. Every move must be executed flawlessly as even the 
slightest mistake can result in failure. It's a relentless cycle of progress and setback where one misstep means starting the grueling process all over again. Believe me when I say, this segment tested my patience more than any Dark Souls boss ever could. Without a doubt, this stands as the most infuriating point of this entire franchise. But after 20 attempts and one YouTube video later, Nate and Elena finally make it ashore. You left those clowns in the dust ages ago! Oh my god! Hey, next time you play this game, why not turn it into a drinking game? Take a shot every time there's a jump scare. You'll be surprised by how many there are. In this scene, there's an interesting detail. The trap was crafted from materials salvaged from their plane, hinting at a cunning foe. As they investigate, they notice footprints that are clearly not human. And then comes the moment that always cracks me up. Shh. Do you hear that? Hear what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We're being watched. Watched? Yeah, you know what, it's probably nothing. Um. As the duo press on in their quest to locate Sully, they encounter Roman's mercenaries, who boast heavier armor and wield deadlier weapons than Eddie's crew. The game showcases a commendable variety of enemies, each presenting unique challenges. There are shotgun-wielding enemies who excel at flanking maneuvers, sharpshooters perched in elevated positions, grenade launcher toting foes who aim to keep you on your toes, and standard gunmen who adeptly utilize cover, picking out to take shots and lob grenades. Additionally, the weapon diversity in the game is surprisingly robust. Unlike titles where you're stuck with the same two guns throughout, Uncharted 1 constantly offers a rotation of approximately 10 different firearms. From shotguns and sniper rifles to grenade launchers and SMGs, there's a wide arsenal at your disposal, allowing for varied combat strategies. This mechanic is carried over into later entries in the series as well. Nevertheless, the pair manage to find Sully, who reveals that the diary saved his life by deflecting a bullet in his pocket. He goes on to explain how he convinced Roman that without his assistance, he could never locate El Dorado. After successfully solving two more puzzles, Nate proceeds to the church, where he searches for specific symbols. The Spanish mark their treasures with these symbols, so Nate believes they hold the key to locating El Dorado. Despite facing yet another frustrating platforming challenge, Nate eventually reaches the designated location, finding both Sully and Elena waiting there. However, the reunion is short-lived, as in the very next scene, they encounter a door that closes before Sully can make it through. Now remember earlier when I mentioned the real Crash Bandicoot levels were yet to come? Well, this chapter exemplifies exactly what I meant. It's a essentially one big crash level. Just take a look at this. However, their escapade takes a sudden turn as they find themselves ambushed. After narrowly escaping, they stumble upon Sir Francis Drake. Now this moment is supposed to be emotional, I think, but I couldn't help but chuckle. My man Francis Drake is a skeleton, yet he still sports his hair and beard. What a legend. Following that intense moment, we're introduced to the zombies. Cornered in a room with Eddie, our sole objective is survival, where Elena drops a rope for us to climb on. Admittedly, the zombies feel a bit lackluster as an enemy type in this game. Personally, I believe fewer but more resilient zombies would have made for more engaging encounters. Nevertheless, Nate and Eddie hold their own against the undead onslaught until Eddie's questionable behavior changes everything. <laughs> Now Nate finds himself alone facing the Horde, a challenge he ultimately overcomes before joining Elena in a desperate escape. Their fronting fight leads them to a German experiment room, setting the stage for further twists and turns in their journey. Here I'd like to touch upon the voice acting in this game. Overall, I found it to be mostly solid, with characters bringing their roles to life effectively. However, there are a few instances where the acting fell short and detracted from the immersion. Don't worry about it. We can argue about it later. It'll be great! 
It's worth noting that in video games, even a handful of poorly delivered lines can disrupt the player's immersion in the narrative. Fortunately, I don't believe this game suffers from that issue consistently. So here, the duo stumbles upon an unexpected obstacle. It turns out the Germans didn't pay their electrical bills. Ever the resourceful adventurer, Nate volunteers to turn on the generator, conveniently leaving her behind. One can't help but wonder what might befall her in his absence. And now, prepare yourselves for the horror segments of this game. Naughty Dog certainly took some risks exploring various tones and genres to gauge their impact. While they ultimately opted out of incorporating horror elements in their later Uncharted games, I found this inclusion quite intriguing. It added depth to the mystery, making the entire experience more immersive and injecting an extra layer of tension into certain moments. So after Nate successfully turns on the generators, he makes a shocking discovery. El Dorado is cursed and whoever opens it will succumb to becoming a zombie. It appears the Germans were attempting to harness this curse for their war efforts. Upon returning to Elena, Nate finds her captured by the enemy forces, leading to a tense standoff. Surprisingly, instead of taking immediate action against Nate or Elena, Roman decides to prioritize retrieving El Dorado. Seizing the opportunity, Nate escapes through the German-built tunnels and heads to the church where El Dorado is hidden. Accompanied by Sully, they confront Roman once again, only to find themselves at gunpoint. However, rather than shooting them, Roman opens El Dorado, transforming into a zombie himself. In the chaos that ensues, Navarro intervenes, killing Roman and seizing Elena before making his escape with a helicopter. Surprise, surprise, Nate manages to hold on to the massive statue dangling from the helicopter, but then, in a sudden turn of events, chaos ensues. <laughs> On the ship, Nate kills a few more bad guys, and then it's time for the final boss fight, which is revolved by some quick time events. So Nate saves Elena, sends Navarro and El Dorado to the bottom of the ocean, and Sully shows up well and alive, also carrying some gold that he got on his way. While I believe this game is perhaps the weakest in the franchise, isn't Uncharted's motto all about greatness from small beginnings? Stay tuned for my next video, a comprehensive retrospective on a game that many consider to be the pinnacle of gaming in the 2000s, Uncharted 2 Among Thieves.